religious differences, but um, we just kind of sat together and watched the people and giggled um, at certain things as they went by. So um, that was kind of a, a meaningful exchange that I had that it didn't involve um, translation or words, and it, it still um, felt really good to me. Um, today we went to the Norbalinka Palace, which was the summer palace uh, and built in 1755 for the seventh Dalai Lama. Um, starting with the seventh Dalai Lama, they started using it as a summer palace and going there. Um, during the summer months and using the patala only during the winter months. And I was just so confused about why they would um, move their entire government about two miles down the street um, for winter and summer. But apparently the patala doesn't have good ventilation and gets a little bit too warm. Um, so Norbalinka was really spread out. There were lots of trees. It kind of felt like a really serene college campus while we were there. First we went to the room of the seventh Dalai Lama and it was kind of interesting. It almost looked to me like the whole place was in the process of fading away. The, uh, the colors were really muted and kind of faded and the whole place just looked like it was almost disappearing before your eyes. It was kind of interesting. And after the 7th Dalai Lama's palace, we went to the 13th and 14th Dalai Lama's palace. And that one particularly looked like it had just been abandoned, which actually I guess it had been when the Dalai Lama left that was actually the palace that he escaped from, dressed as a uh, Tibetan guard. Both palaces were set on the, were set in a really nice area. There was a whole large grounds that you could wander around for a while. There was a man-made lake, and there was a lot of woods. This afternoon, we went into Barkor Square to do a little bit of shopping, and I am definitely green. I've lost, I think, uh, most of my bargaining powers and haven't had enough time to get back into the swing of things. Uh, the first woman that I stopped at her stall, she was very aggressive and kept trying to sell me something that I just could never afford. I mean, it was just way too much and I don't have the budget for it. Uh, I eventually ended up buying a human skull with inla inlaid silver. The skull, as weird as it may sound to us, it's, uh, from the reading that I've done in Tibetan culture, when somebody dies, their soul leaves and the body is just a vessel and it's not a big deal. So to have uh, somebody's skull, for example, when, some, when your best friend dies, you usually take their part of their skull and it's a memory thing, something to remember them by. And they'll make bowls out of them and everyday household objects out of bone and skulls of people so that they can remember them by. And uh, they don't get as freaked out by having body parts around as we in the West do. Today we went to the market in the Barcourt Square and um, it was my first time shopping here in Lhasa and it wasn't as scary or overwhelming as I thought it might be. Um, I bargained down to about, I guess, a third of what they had asked for my little tchotchke, um, which has a monkey on it. And I really like monkeys and so I was happy to get that. We did find a Tibetan woman who was selling, uh, had a little stall there, and we got a chance to talk to her through an interpreter, and that was actually really nice. She's been there for about five years selling the stuff. She works every single day, apparently doesn't take any vacations. Uh, she buys her goods from mostly from Tibet. She had a lot of interesting, wide variety of things. And uh, I think packing that stuff up every night and unpacking it every morning, that's got to be a huge chore in and of itself. I think I got a lot of what I hope to get out of this experience. Um, I think first and foremost, I wanted to experience a third world country. I'm not sure if this counts as third world anymore. It seems to be fairly modernized. Um, but I wanted to experience a different culture 
meet new people and see different sights and sounds and Tibet delivered that in an overwhelmingly <laughs> positive way. Um, the scenery was beautiful, the people were wonderful, and I really had a nice time just seeing different sights and um, I felt that I got to see some of the religious aspects, some of the cultural aspects, um, and just really get to see different parts of life here, political and religious, and just day to day. My biggest perception that has changed from having spent time here in Tibet, and I'm really surprised about this, is I'm no longer sure that Tibet really needs to be an independent nation. Before I came, free Tibet seemed like such an obvious and cut and dry statement. It, I mean, I was like, of course, free Tibet. Why wouldn't you want them to be free Tibet? And now having been here and having talked to some Tibetans about the whole situation, I'm not at all sure that Tibet needs to be an independent state, and I'm not the least bit convinced that most Tibetans or even want that. I'm hoping that my experience here will allow me to um, talk to people, especially those people that maybe have a simplified view of the Free Tibet campaign, and maybe convey not a straight answer, but just get them to think a little bit more about how maybe the only source of information they have is the American media and that there might be other viewpoints to be had. Um, I would really like to share some of the information I've learned here. Because of uh, language differences, I didn't really get a chance to find out too much what Tibetans think of America or, or Americans. But I can say that there were a number of times when people asked me where I was from and I would say America. And it was always greeted with a smile and, oh, America, America, America. It was it was always a happy response, which I was glad to hear. I was, and, uh, I was a little nervous the first few times I said I'm an American. A lot of times overseas when you say that you get scorn and bad looks, but here everybody seemed pretty happy to say hello and glad I came so far to see their country. The more I talked to people here, um, the more I found out that they're actually really grateful to the Chinese for some of the new um, improvements and opportunities that they have. Uh, certainly in education and in consumer goods, they have a lot more choices. Um, with education, they're learning Tibetan, Chinese, and English, um, and I think that's helping them to get by in the world and make an influence here. Um, I was impressed that they're actually still learning Tibetan as well as the other two languages, and it seems that they're trying to retain their culture and identity while also embracing the change and modernity and having better lives. I think the most important advice I could give to anybody who wants to come to Tibet is to come with an open mind and try to let go of all your, your notions that you have about Tibet. Uh, I know personally I had a lot of notions that were sort of force fed to me and I'm now realizing more than ever that American media and um, just the American point of view is really, really one-sided. And it was very hard at first to not have knee-jerk reactions to everything anybody said. And it took a while to let go of that. But after a while, I finally managed to. It's been two weeks, and I'm starting to get over my knee-jerk reactions to what communism is all about and what free Tibet is all about, and starting to actually listen and look and really see what's going on. And I think that's uh, a very important thing for anybody coming here. Size thing of ginger. <laughs> <laughs>